Hello everyone, welcome to Open Tesla 2022. Our presentation is titled Electronic Pegs and Round Holes, Digital Confidence in Online Learning. Thank you for joining us. Hello everybody, hello, my name's David. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. And my name is Michael. So we're, our, we're the presenters today, we'll be guiding you through our presentation. So first a little about me, I'm from Canada, but I've been, I'm an educator at RMIT University for the past four years plus, and I've been teaching in Vietnam for around eight years. And before that, I taught at schools in South Korea. So a lot of different contexts, including online. Also a little bit about me. I also work at uh, RMIT Saigon South, started my career in the Czech Republic. I've worked in Japan and uh, spent most of my time in Vietnam and I've worked at RMIT Saigon South for about four years now. I currently hold the role of educator and student engagement specialist. Hey David, a uh, quick question. Our, our conference is titled Electronic Pegs and Round Holes. W what does that mean? Good question, Mike. Um, you ever heard of the phrase, have you heard the phrase, to put a square peg in a round hole? Uh, yeah, I've heard it. I took me a while to understand what it meant. It's like something doesn't work in some area or something. Something like that. So it means to put something that doesn't fit into a place or situation. And uh, we feel that online learning during the 2020 period was very much like putting square pegs in round holes as we had to learn to adapt and learn all of the different tech and the tools and sort of try and train our students in how to use these tools. So it's very much like square pegs and round holes. So I thought that sort of saying was very apt in designing a webinar about trying to develop digital confidence, trying to develop our skill sets and working towards a better way of teaching online. And I thought we call it electronic pegs and round holes. Well, it sounds better than square pegs in my opinion. <laughs> I don't know what other people think. Leave your comments below <laughs> what you think. Yeah. Okay. A bit about our teaching context. Um, so we both work at the School of English University Pathways. Just to tell you a little bit about our school, our average class size is about 16 to 20 students per class. Course delivery is 20 hours per week for 10 weeks, and we teach beginner to advance. Here's our session overview. I'm not going to talk you through it. I will say that at the end, we have not so much time for Q&A, but please leave a questions in the comment section below. We will definitely answer your questions. So if there's any part that would you like to comment on, if you or if you have any questions for us, please leave a question or comment for us and we'll definitely get back to you in the comment section of this video. So we're going to start with talking about current methodologies and pedagogical models during the online learning phase. And Mike, you're going to take it away. Now moving on to current methodologies and pedagogical models. And for the purposes of our conversation here, I'm not going to distinguish the difference between methodologies and pedagogical models. So as we moved from the face-to-face -face classroom to an online classroom, uh, we had to tra transition activities that were meant for a face-to-face -face class and handouts that were meant for a face-to-face -face class to an online class. So we used these specially design, designed and developed tools to engage and connect with our students in the, the online classroom. We had a lot of games, like just to name a few, Kahoot, Quizzes, Quizlet, Wordwall, Socrative, all these games were really great for gamifying lessons, some great tools. I particularly liked Flipgrid. Flipgrid, it was an online tool for a speaking task. thought it was really good for, for that. So if you have any other ideas about games or tools that you use, please add them in the comments below. So let's look at our first methodological framework, uh, flipping the classroom. And what is this? What should we flip and what should be flipped and why flip things? So basically it is streamlining our the pacing of our synchronous online classrooms. You're focusing on activities for students to complete in the class while 
flipping other activities because there's just so much in the curriculum that needs to be covered. So it really is assigning more homework for our students where they can work with the your your language management system, your LMS, whether it's Moodle or Canvas as we use, and they can complete tasks on their own. There are some issues which is increased amount of homework. The students have a lot more to do outside of class after already completing the tasks in class than to do something similar outside of class. There's a potential for increasing anxiety if your students don't do the homework. If they come to class, you sign something and then the next day they hadn't done it, the whole the whole model becomes redundant if the students don't complete their tasks prior to the lesson. Let's look at the process oriented pedagogy. So basically this is kind of like enjoying what you are doing uh, and focusing on the process, trusting the process and not focusing on the results. Teachers would act more like facilitators, guiding students along. Now it might require at the beginning a higher level of scaffolding. It does require a higher level of scaffolding um, where you're helping the students focus and generate the ideas and they are perfectly welcome to make mistakes. The students are encouraged to make mistakes. It is this process where we're focusing on the learning and so mistakes, mistakes are highly encouraged. It's kind of like a guided discovery in a way if you're looking at that methodological framework uh, of um, orienting a class in that direction. Now there are some issues and some of the issues are uh, kind of the time that it takes to, to scaffold. It takes a lot of time. So you want to kind of select the appropriate scaffolds that match the diverse uh, learning styles and communication styles of your students, especially in the online delivery. You need to know your students and if they don't turn their microphones on or cameras on, it's a little bit difficult to know who they are and what they need exactly. Now let's look at the communicative approach. It is like it sounds. There is a much higher level focus on fluency uh, rather than accuracy or say like grammar points or things like that. It's more about the fluency and just getting them, the students to produce the language. It's also establishing a connection. So kind of creating that rapport with your students. Um, you want to create this online dialogue with them, encouraging group reflection. Uh, this also lends itself quite nicely to a materials light uh, lesson plan where you are planning out the lesson and having the students generate the content where they're bringing fo photos or bits of writing or past experiences into this material light, light style community communicative approach. So there are some issues with this. Certain students are focused more on passing exams. They might be interested in just taking an IELTS class and getting an IELTS certificate. Um, and that's great, but it's not going to really improve their fluency as much. They're going to have some a set of memorized phrases that's not exactly fluency. So some students are like that. They have that kind of orientation. Some students are resistant. They're just more focused on the rules. Um, they're more focused on building the vocabulary and grammar knowledge rather than than uh, the fluency. Also, speaking one at a time is a challenge for this approach in an online situation where we have to turn our microphones on and off, put your hand up, nominate people, uh, nominate the students. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the solution for this is, but what do you think? Leave it in the comment below if you have any uh, thoughts on that. Uh, David, do you want to take it from here? Sure, thank you, Mike. OK, let's talk about the student perspective. I'd like to start this segment with a little quote from a study done on online learning and anxiety. The study showed that students who are already struggling academically in their studies are more likely to obtain lower scores once they transfer to online learning. Now, I'm sure this is not news to anybody. This seems like quite a normal sort of uh, result of students who perhaps are struggling academically in general. But in my opinion, it is my belief that um, if we want to make online learning a truly dynamic, motivational, engaging space for our learners, 
these are the students that we need to sort of uh, cater towards or these are the students we need to get on board with or get on board with on online learning because these are the ones that are going to have problems so um, I feel as though it's worth for us to consider some of the issues with online learning and some of the problems from a student's perspective what are the issues and only through understanding some of the problems could we develop our approaches and methodologies and planning uh, towards making it more of a fun engaging and educational space for our learners so let's take a look at some of the recent sort of experiences and some of the problems that students have brought to my attention so let's move to the next slide okay so through my conversations with students i like to just stress most of these are purely conversational based and uh, anecdotal but what I have gauged from the recent experience of online learning, a lot of my, a lot of students, shall we say, have mentioned just these issues as problems in the online classroom. For example, too much teacher talk, the teacher spending too much time narrating the lessons to the point whereby students just tune out. Uh, we've also had students mention that they lack the skills to use a lot of the apps. Maybe they're not familiar with the apps. Maybe the teachers are just sending them documents, expecting them to understand how to use it or how to open it or how to share it. And they haven't received adequate training. So a lack of tech skills that could be extended to perhaps a lack of tech. I definitely have experienced in my online classrooms, students just not having the relevant tech. Maybe they don't have a camera or a microphone or uh, as we move on to the next issue, a lack of connectivity. Uh, in some cases, this is a valid point. There are students who I've taught in my context who are living in very remote areas and it's a reality for them at certain times of the day, the internet is just not an option. So um, there, that is something that we as educators need to be aware of. It's something we don't know what the solutions are just yet, but perhaps just keep that in your mind as we go into the online lessons that maybe the student does want to sort of contribute but it's purely just based on the connectivity that they can't the next one we have is a lack of confidence speaking in the online classroom so this could be for various reasons uh, students well being online is quite a new experience for our students uh, it can be quite daunting switching on your microphone and having 20 20 plus possibly students who you haven't met before and a teacher listening intently to every word or possibly listening for every mistake that you might make and then correcting it. So that there's a definite a sort of pre, sort of a familiarization process. It will take a while for our students to sort of develop their confidence. Certain students might take longer, but uh, it's something that teachers need to be aware of. We need to sort of help them. Maybe they need some sort of training in this. Maybe there's some sort of digital confidence that we can do with them or exercises just to develop some of that fluency and some build that confidence that they need to have when they're online. This one I think is very important. It's the environment issue. Cannot learn in the home environment. Students perhaps not optimizing their learning space. There's various reasons for this. It could be that they're sharing uh, a, a room, a bedroom in which to learn when. It could be that there are more, maybe a whole family living in a very confined space. They could have family members watching them as they are learning, which creates its own sort of form of anxiety. But it's, it's something that we as educators cannot sort of fully grasp or feel, fully solve. But I feel as though it's something we need to sort of consider that this is something that students have to contend with. It's something that they perhaps don't always have control over and that it does affect a lot of their sort of experiences of being online and why it's a negative experience for them being online. And it's something that perhaps we as educators could be a little bit more sympathetic to. So just it's something to consider, like just the home environment issues for students. And it has been something that's been brought up to my attention where students have said, they cannot learn at home. They just don't like being in their home environment and trying to study at the same time. The last point here is I'd like to mention is just being distracted by social media. This could be extended to being distracted by pretty much any for any stimulus could be distracting. It's something that once again, we won't have much control of as teachers. Um, once the cameras go off, there's not much the teacher can see and we can't exactly say to our students, is that a phone in your hand? Turn it off. 
So it's something that we don't have much control of. It's something that students will do, I'm sure, if we if we let them. But it's something that we need to be aware of. It's something that we need to think about. And maybe we could utilize to our advantage. We could perhaps use social media in our teaching as, as a way of delivering our message or communicating our message with our students. So those are the, some of the recent experience of online learning. Those are some of the experiences that have been brought to my attention. And I feel as though that these points are important because to truly understand it, to truly understand our students and make the whole online learning experience better for, for our students primarily, we should use these ideas and find solutions to them in order to develop the technology and develop our lessons and make the learning experience just better for everyone involved, both teachers and students. So that moves us to the next section where we're going to talk about best practices. Mike, I believe you're going to take over for this part. Thanks, David. That was really thorough. Uh, a lot of good ideas to actually think about there. Thanks. Yeah, so moving on to the best practice. Thank you, David, for uh, telling us about the students' perspectives. It was very uh, thorough. So in best practices, what can we do to prepare both the students, the teachers, and their schools for future online studies? So let's talk about the best practices in your own class and for your school. So we're going to look at the educators and decision makers and, and which best practices that we think we could go forward with in into the future. So best practices for you, the educator, if you're an educator. So you want to establish the rules early, like first language usage in class. You want to think about if it's an English classroom, you want to think about your uh, how much English you expect the students to use. So you want to choose the level, the amount of English that is appropriate for the level. So for example, in a breakout room, say in an upper intermediate class, you might say for the first two minutes, you can use a little bit of L1 so everybody understands where we're going with this activity. And then from that point on, I expect you to use the next 10 minutes English only. And while you pop in and out of each breakout room, then you can monitor that and the students should know clearly what they're expected. Alternatively, you could have the, for the first 15 minutes of class, maybe a lot of L1 in class, that's okay, it's acceptable. And then for the remaining 45 minutes of the class, have, have uh, English only. You wanna establish a clear camera on policy. So students, maybe you might wanna be relaxed with it, but expect them to turn it on most of the time. Sometimes you can imagine if someone is on a device, they're holding it up to their face and they're getting a close up of their face, so they might be anxious. They might feel nervous about that. You wanna create uh, leaderships, leadership positions for the students in your classroom. Um, let students help each other. Some of the students are more tech savvy uh, than we are. So you want to help them guide the class. And so don't be afraid to hand over the reins to the students. Sometimes uh, it was fun. I would let them do that. <laughs> Very nerve wracking, but also it was fun and it builds trust. You want to reward participation. So thinking about how the students are participating, what they're doing, what they're contributing. And if they aren't contributing, maybe for a few days, that's OK. After that, get after them. But I think rewarding and praising students for participating is very important. Uh, you want to get students to optimize their learning space, as David had mentioned. So having a notepad, a pen, paper, having their books ready, the keyboard, and the mouse, ideally uh, a desktop or a laptop computer for the classroom and not a, a phone. So you want to try also to embrace the process-based learning into your lesson planning. As discussed in our previous segment, uh, the process-based learning involves your students' prob problem solving, it's kind of moving away from these traditional methods and more adopting this guided discovery methodology that kind of focuses on uh, yeah, problem solving rather than telling the students what is right or what is wrong. There's been a lot of research and a lot of educators believe that this is a way to retain our students' interest and attention. Gamification is also a great, a great uh, pedagogy to use, a great theory to use. It's not really a standalone method, but you want to identify what things need to be gamified. So, um, you know, basically you're using elements like scoring and peer competition, and it's also a way to test your students. 
So when you're identifying what needs to be gamified, things that lend itself quite nicely are, you know, grammar points, um, vocabulary, vocabulary matching activities, synonyms, things like that. Those are all great ways to gamify a lesson. You also want to know your students and know if they actually want to play games in the lesson. You want to set the rules for the game, um, like they have a certain time limit to sign in. They don't, you know, because quite often people might be waiting around. If they have a lag, that's OK. Just keep going. Uh, you want to keep it flexible in that respect and also extend the gamification into feedback. So do provide some feedback. A lot of those games that we mentioned earlier uh, had have feedback uh, at the end of the game to tell them what percentage of the students answered each uh, question right or wrong. So that's like in the soccer tip or any kind of activity, any kind of uh, software like that. So best practices and considerations for the decision makers at your at your institution. Maybe there's no perfect methodological framework or pedagogical theory that fits each context. Um, so you want to think about streamlining content. So a little bit of flipping, but not too much, right? <laughs> Uh, bearable schedules. So th think about the amount of screen time. You want to optimize your screen time so we're not burning out our, our retinas. Changing assessment to reflect and util utilize the, uh, the nature of the digital content. So rather than having traditional exams, they could use more software oriented assessment types like I don't know, it's Instagram or projects writing about their experiencing discussing experiences, discussing what it was like to study online. Or like a like a vlog, even like a video video log or a blog post, those could all be used. Um, also, documenting. So research research has also shown that documenting students and faculty experience is really uh, vital for understanding the long term implications of e learning on teaching. This way, you can adapt the curriculum to an online audience. David, can you talk about closing thoughts? Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mike. All right, I've got two main closing thoughts for us today to end out this webinar. The first one I'd like to talk about is allow time for normalization. Online learning is still quite new. It came to us quite suddenly during the 2020 and 2022 period. In some cases, we were unprepared for the challenges that came with it. It will take a while for us still at this point to become familiar with the tools, the tech, the work environment. We'll need to adapt still. We'll, we'll still need to learn new skills as the tech develops even more so in the future. So allow time for normalization. It will take a while for us all to get good at it. It will take a while for our students to be familiar with it. But eventually, it is my belief that online learning will one day be as natural to us and to our students as the classroom is to us now. Allow time. Our students are still adapting and finding out their level of comfort. It will take time, but the tech is ready. Industries are ready. There's definitely a hunger and clamor for online learning. It's important that we still persist with it, experiment with it at this stage. It will take time or everything we learn now will be relevant moving into the future. So yeah, my, my, our first point is allow time for normalization. We're still in a phase of learning, developing, experimenting, but everything we'll, we'll, we learn now will be relevant and will make the experience better for us in the future. And it will take time. So yeah, I'm sure we all have struggles with uh, online learning. All of this will make us better as we develop our skills for the future. That's my first thought. The second thought, let's move on to the second one. Shift the discussion. So often around the staff room, I talk to a lot of educators. I also talk to my students about this. And I often hear them saying how they prefer being face-to-face -face in the classroom over online learning. And then reading out a list of things that they perhaps did not enjoy about online learning. A bit, bit like what we had just then. I feel as though this discussion has to end. It's no longer a case of which one is better, but it has, it's more of a case of which one are we doing today? Shift the discussion. Um, I think we need to accept that online learning will be with us for a long time. If you look at the data, if you look at where the industry is going, if you look at some of the 
large tech companies and where the money is being invested at the moment, a lot of it is being invested in online learning. Universities are developing online learning departments specifically uh, to deliver their courses online to an international audience. There's a lot of money and research being invested. To repeat the point I made in the last one about allowing time, the skills we learn now will be valuable in the future. And this will extend to the students as well. The skills that they're going to be learning online will be value for them as they develop in their education in the future, as they move further into education to higher ed. So it's no longer about, I prefer classroom and these skills don't exactly apply and that online learning is perhaps not as effective or in this sort of regard. It's more about how can we make online learning better? What things can we do? What are the tools that we can learn? So it's very important that we shift the discussion and accept that two education and face-to-face -face are two different sort of models. And it's important that we have both in our skill sets. So let's shift the discussion. Thank you, Mike. I think that closes our webinar for the day. Thanks, David. Yeah, um, it does. I thought that was really interesting. Um, great closing thoughts. Uh, there's a lot to take away from that. Here is some of the places that we received, we read. This is where we collected the articles, collected information, tried to put this together for you guys. So you take a look at it online. Um, all right. Thanks, guys. Thanks Thank for you guys. everyone. Yep, for spending Thank you, your everyone. Time. Please leave a comment or a question in the comment section below. Yeah. Yeah, please do. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any other ideas or you think we missed anything important, please add it down below.